Are you paying attention oh, uh, yeah. at all to Three Eye Atlas? Are you oh, watching the, that? the comet? Yeah, whatever um, it is. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if if I was aware of any evidence of aliens, um, you, Joe, you have my word. I will come on your show, and I will reveal it on the show. Okay. Yeah. That's um, a good deal. Yeah, it's pretty good. I deal. believe you. Yeah, yeah thank yeah, you. I, I, I mean, Appreciate I'll, that. I'll, I'll stick. To, I, I keep my, you know keep my promises. So. <laughs> Scotty, beam me up. What if an interstellar object whirling through our solar system isn't a comet at all, but a nuclear-powered spacecraft sent to test how humans respond? That's the unsettling. What if, behind tonight's thought experiment? And yes, beam me Scotty, because we're about to step into a scenario where the line between nature and technology blurs so hard it rattles the moon. To be clear from the first breath, this is a speculative narrative built on real physics and real observation methods not a claim that a lunar impact is scheduled. It's a controlled, what if, to stress test our assumptions, our instruments, and our nerve. Picture it, July 1, 2025. A faint, fast mover pops on survey images. Three-ish atlas clearly interstellar, clearly not born here. At first, nothing more than a distant wanderer with a high inbound velocity. But as nights pass and fits improve, its path slices along the ecliptic with surgical neatness. That geometry is weird. Interstellar arrivals should come from anywhere, not the thin plane where our planets travel. People whisper about odds and intention. The signal to noise on the rumor line spikes. Harvard's Avi Loeb, never shy about asking the question everyone sidesteps, reminds us publicly that artificial is a hypothesis, not a punchline. The media lights the fuse, and the rest of us, we stare at the data and try not to blink. On the lab side, spectrographs do what spectrographs do. If this were a garden variety comet, you'd expect a certain chemical chorus, water loud, co and co2 in harmony, metals muted. Instead, the lines don't sing the way they should. Carbon monoxide dominates. Water is quiet. Nickel teases at the edge of detectability while iron, its usual partner, plays hard to get. Is it calibration, phase angle, dust physics? Maybe. But as the fits stabilize, the natural but odd column starts filling with question marks. Meanwhile, imaging campaigns notice an occasional sunward feature, an anti-tail, exactly the direction a textbook says dust shouldn't prefer. Now we're not just puzzling over chemistry, we're puzzling over choreography. Here's the moment the story tilts from curiosity to consequence. Our what-if forks, in one branch 3i Atlas threads the Earth, Moon system harmlessly and sails on, leaving us with beautiful spectra, a hundred papers and a new chapter in comet science. In the other branch, the one we explore tonight, the refined track takes a harder line toward the lunar surface. No atmosphere there, no cushion. Energy in equals energy out. A mountain-sized body at interstellar speed would carve a fresh scar on a world we've watched since we had eyes to lift. What would that look like? First, light. The impact plume would flash into brilliance, a glare against night that backyard cameras would catch from suburbs and mountaintops alike. Then the moon would ring, not like a bell you hear, but like a seismometer feels. Old Apollo arrays and modern counterparts would trace waves through the crust, the mantle, the deep places that still hold secrets about how our companion formed. The crater would settle into permanence, dozens of kilometers across, depending on the projectile's true size and density. A new landmark visible in high-rays maps and maybe, to patient, knowledgeable eyes through a good amateur scope. Now the part that turns a spectacle into a scientific windfall. Ejecta would expose subsurface layers, sampling geology without a drill. If fragments escape, we'd briefly get a dusty hail, faint shifting, a natural laboratory for light scattering and dust dynamics in weak gravity. Telescopes would watch across the spectrum, radio through gamma chasing chemistry, shock physics and time variable glow. Orbiters would pivot. Rovers, current and planned, would update routes, risk models and goals. Seismology teams would sprint. Data pipelines would groan. It would be the most densely observed impact in history. But why stop at the blast when the deeper question is motive? Our scale runs 0 to 10. 0 means natural for sure. 10 means technological on purpose. Where would this sit? Its interstellar speed is no smoking gun. Nature can do that. Its ecliptic hugging geometry is improbable, not impossible. Survey bias and small number statistics can be tricksters. Chemistry that leans carbon monoxide heavy with low water could be the signature of a radiation processed crust. 
Cosmic rays can bake surfaces into red, refractory skins that vent volatiles out of order. Even an anti-tail can be explained with projection effects and dust grain dynamics under solar radiation pressure. One anomaly is a curiosity. A stack of them is a thesis defense. And yet, even as the natural but exotic arguments line up, a different question keeps tapping the glass. If a civilization wanted to test our awareness without risking us, where would it aim? At the moon, our mirror, our shield, our laboratory, visible to us, harmless to our biosphere. Suppose, then, that 3 I Atlas isn't just drifting. Suppose it can finesse its path with nudges no bigger than the outgassing jets we already measure on comets. Tiny, steady, cumulative. From far away, control looks like coincidence. Up close, coincidence starts to look like control. You wouldn't see big burns. You'd infer small thrusts. You'd argue about mass loss budgets and complain that the coma never got as dense as the equation said it must if jetting were the whole story. You'd convene telecons. You'd ask for raw frames you can't unsee once you see them. You'd balance caution with curiosity and hope you've got the calibration right. Meanwhile, planetary defense folks would be having a very different conversation. We've built playbooks for slow, bound rocks you can push years in advance. We do not have a playbook for fast, unbound visitors that announce themselves late and cross the stage quickly. If tonight, what if we're earthbound rather than moonbound, we would be practicing resilience, not deflection. That's the quiet, sobering line under the headline. Our early warning architecture needs to see colder, smaller, faster, farther. More sky, more cadence, more infrared, more cooperation, less daylight between data and decision. And if in this story the object really were technological, what would we learn from an impact we didn't stop? First, that someone out there understands our attention economy. Hit the moon, not the earth, and every telescope we own will watch. Second, that they understand our science. Give us a controlled shock and we'll turn it into seismology, petrology, plasma physics, and a thousand graduate theses. Third, that they understand our psychology. Show power without harm and you don't terrorize. You recruit curiosity. None of that requires a conspiracy. It only requires that we admit a possibility while we test it to destruction with data. Until then, the most responsible posture is this. Treat 3i Atlas as natural and less, and until evidence compels a different verdict. Observe as if the verdict matters. Upgrade our sky watch either way. So if the plume rose tonight, what would change tomorrow? Mission plans would. Landing sites would. Science priorities would. A fresh impact would become a Rosetta Stone for lunar history and a stress test for off-world infrastructure. Private companies would eye the rim and murmur about resource carts and sampling arms. School kids would point at the moon and say, I remember when that wasn't there. And somewhere, perhaps, a distant antenna would mark our response and file it under species. Engages with curiosity under stress. If the plume doesn't rise, if 3i Atlas angles wide and sails on, then the change is subtler and just as real. We will have rehearsed the coordination a true crisis would demand. We will have wrung better precision out of our instruments. We will have argued in public, where science belongs, about evidence and extraordinary claims, and we will have come away with a tighter, faster, humbler system for the next surprise. Either way, we win by looking harder. So here, where we land. The moon is not a stage set. Space is not quiet background. Interstellar visitors are not rare anymore. They're rare until they are. Between 0 and 10 on that technology scale lives a wide country of natural phenomena we barely understand, and a smaller country of possibilities we shouldn't rule out just to look safe. Our job is to map both with honesty and with nerve. If 3i Atlas is a comet, let it teach us new comet physics. If it's something else, let it teach us something about ourselves. And if, one night, the sky does flare over the moon and every screen on Earth lights up with the same shock, Remember the first sentence we agreed on together. This was a thought experiment. Run so we could meet reality with clear eyes. Curiosity is not the opposite of caution. It's the discipline that makes caution useful. Beam me Scotty indeed. Not to escape but to arrive. Right where the data is with the courage to follow it.